This video is brought to you by Brilliant. Get a free trial with Brilliant and take advantage of its hands-on STEM learning lessons. More on them in a bit. In the twilight of imperial rule, a woman rose to power in China who would transform the Middle Kingdom. Yanara Tsing, better known as Dowager Empress Si Qi, was as clever as she was ambitious. Born into a respectable dish family, she became a low-ranking concubine in the Forbidden City, only to work her way up to the very top. Through a combination of intrigue, cunning, and constantly underrated intelligence, she rose through a male-dominated world to become the most powerful person in China, and she'd use that power to transform the empire. As a woman behind the throne, Si Qi unleashed a wave of modernization that upended the late Qing dynasty. Under her 40-year reign, China opened up itself to the West, began to industrialize, and even made moves towards democracy. Yet, for all the undoubted good she did, there was also a dark side to the Dowager Empress. Implicated in a number of assassinations, swept up in the bloody horrors of the Boxer Rebellion, Si Chi walked a fine line between enlightened leader and cold-blooded Machiavellian. Today, Biographies is investigating the story of the ordinary girl who became Imperial China's matriarch. There's an old curse attributed to ancient China, which supposedly goes, May you live in interesting times. No one could have known it at the moment of her birth, but the girl who would become Si Chi was destined to live through some of the most interesting times in history. Born Yehanara Singh on November 29, 1835, Si Chi's early life is shrouded in mystery. Almost no formal records of her first 16 years exist, leaving us to piece together what we can from later sources. We know that she was a Manchu, part of the minority ethnic class that had ruled majority Han China since the 1660s. We know, too, that her father was a mid-level government official the sort of guy who could give his family a comfortable life in a nice part of Beijing. We also know that she was born at a point when China was about to embark on an unprecedented era of crisis. In 1839, when Si Qi was just four, the First Opium War would see China trounced by the British, beginning a multi-decade series of conflicts, civil wars, rebellions, and outside interference known as the Century of Humiliation. But while the First Opium War passed little Si Qi by, she would soon find herself at the epicenter of the wave of coming conflicts. And speaking of Si Qi, now might be a good time to make a quick note on names. Si Qi was the name given to the girl born Yehanara Singh once she reached the position of Dowager Empress, sort of like how in ancient Rome Octavian became Emperor Augustus. But since Si Qi received a new name almost every time she changed ranks, there's just no way that we going to be able to use the chronologically correct ones without confusing the hell out of absolutely everybody. So, in the interests of making things simple, we're just going to call her Si Chi throughout. Also, regarding the pronunciation of her name, I did look it up. There are some conflicting ones, but I went with my main pronunciation dictionary, which says Si Chi, so... Here we are, everybody. As a girl in Qing Dynasty China, Si Qi grew up learning ladylike pursuits, which meant that she could paint and play chess, but was never taught to read or write. Yet even at this young age, there were signs she wouldn't be bound by traditional gender roles. When Si Qi was a preteen, the Dao Guang Emperor announced that serious money was missing from the imperial treasury. Rather than try and find the culprit, he ordered anyone who'd ever worked there to shoulder part of the debt, a description that unfortunately included one of Si Qi's ancestors. With the debt passed on to living relatives, her father was in danger of being thrown in prison. According to legend, though, Si Chi went out and somehow managed to raise 60% of the debt in loans. From that point on, the story goes, her father valued her opinion as highly as he would a son. Kind of a backhand compliment today, but a serious deal in a society that ranks women equal to, well, a comfortable armchair. Not that Si Chi suffered as badly as most women of her era. As a Manchu, she was exempt from the painful hand tradition of footbinding, a practice she had banned in later life. But while Si Chi's ethnicity would save her feet from being mutilated, the same can't be said of her soul. In 1850, the old emperor died and was replaced with the Xia Feng Emperor. This began Imperial China. One of the new emperor's most important tasks wasn't modernizing his empire or anything silly like that, but rather choosing his new harem. So when she turned 16, Si Chi, like every Manchu girl, was summoned to the capital to partake in an absurd face-to-face -face version of Hot or Not. In a courtyard of the Forbidden City, she was made to stand with hundreds of other women while Xia Feng strutted up and down, trying to decide 
who to get jiggy with. In the end, it was her eyes that did it. Every account ever written of Sichi notes how enthralling her eyes were. Evidently, the emperor thought so too. That day, Sichi was one of ten women chosen for Xianfeng's harem. She moved into the Forbidden City on June 26, 1852, as a low-ranking concubine. Yet, before a decade was out, she'd have managed to claw her way to the very top. For a teenage girl used to, if we believe the legends, being treated as equal as a boy, life in the Forbidden City must have been unbearably strange to Sichi. On the one hand, she was given maids and eunuchs to attend to her, and she lived with the other concubines in a grand set of suites. On the other hand, the men in her life had gone from seeing her as almost as good as a boy to a pretty sex robot that was only good for one thing. Once, while she was with the Emperor, Sichi made the mistake of trying to use her giant brain to suggest ways the army might overcome the deadly Taiping Rebellion roiling China's south. But rather than being all like, whoa, this chick is uh, pretty smart, Shifeng was like, a girl? <laughs> Giving a man advice? Please. Gods! In some tellings, the Emperor was so angry he signed Sichi's death warrants. Which means the fact that this video isn't about to end right now was down to one person. On the same day that Sichi's eyes had caught the Emperor's attention, another concubine had been admitted to the palace. Called Zhen, but known to history as Xian, she had been elevated to the rank of Empress. Rather than a source of jealousy between the two women, their different statuses would save Sichi's life. When she found out about the death warrant, Xian went to the Emperor and laid it on thick. Exactly what she said is unknown, but it likely involved a whole lot of flattery and also the suggestion that maybe, just maybe, an intelligent, outspoken concubine might be more useful alive than dead. Whatever she said, it clearly worked. Not only did the Emperor forgive Sichi, he promoted her, boosting her from his sixth rank concubine to number five. Again, to our ears, that probably sounds like a bit of a veiled insult, but in Imperial China, where rank was everything, it represented a massive boost in her fortunes. She even got a new name. From her original concubine name of Lan or Orchid, she became Yi exemplary. But this would have nothing on the boost she had received soon after. Like many global dynasties of the era, the Qing were obsessed with producing male heirs. Unfortunately, Xian Feng was struggling like hell to sire any boys. So when Sichi gave birth to a child on April the 27th, 1856, and it turned out to be a little dude with a pee-pee, for the Qing, it was party time. The birth of baby Zaichun, when Sichi was just 20 years old, catapulted her from only alive thanks to Xi'an to second most important woman in the country. While Chinese custom meant Empress Xi'an was legally considered the mother, being the concubine who birthed the heir still carried a whole ton of clout. Sichi was promoted first to rank four, then, with no more concubines producing male heirs, right up to rank three noble consort. It was the beginning of her rise to power, one that would only accelerate when her biological son became the emperor. And it turned out that was going to happen a whole lot sooner than anybody anticipated. The same year Zaijun was born, the British launched their wholly unwanted sequel to the original Opium War. Like any good blockbuster, the Second Opium War was bigger, crazier, and above all else, a cynical attempt to make its creators as much money as humanly possible. As the Taiping Rebellion continued to pull China apart, the British sent diplomats to negotiate a brutally one-sided peace. In retaliation, the Emperor had them all arrested. So the British did what they did best. They burned down one of the seats of government. The 1860 attack on the Summer Palace came just as people gathered to celebrate the Emperor's 30th birthday. Sichi, Xian, and Bo were forced to flee ahead of an orgy of looting and burning. In the wake of the palace's destruction, what other choice did the Emperor have? Broken, crushed, Xianfeng dispatched his brother, Prince Gong, to make peace. The resulting treaty saw China humiliated. Swaths of territory were lost. Europeans were given staggering concessions in trade and religious freedom and exemptions from Chinese laws. For an emperor who'd grown up despising the West, it must have been a bit of a bitter pill to swallow. Fortunately, Xianfeng wouldn't be around to witness the aftermath. In August 1861, the emperor began coughing up blood. After a short illness, he passed away, leaving only a single male heir. And just like that, young Sichi found herself mother of the new emperor. Now, just before we continue with today's video, let me tell you about today's fantastic sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant, for those who don't already know, is a website and app built on the idea 
of active problem solving. Because it takes more to learn something than just watching it. To really learn something, you actually have to do it. You have to practice it. Which is why Brilliant has tons of lessons on its platform for lifelong learners who aren't just content to coast through adulthood with the skills that they learned in school. For example, have you ever wanted to learn how computer programming works but were put off by intimidating and opaque coding language? Well, Brilliant help you learn how to program without having to dig deep through the weeds of coding syntax. This is thanks to fun interactive challenges. Brilliant users can shift around blocks of pseudocode that then get immediate feedback on their results. It's an engaging way to understand how computer algorithms work, and once you've got that down, the coding syntax becomes just a lot less intimidating. On Brilliant, it's not about memorizing or regurgitating facts for a test. You can just pick a course you're interested in and get started. Feeling stuck? Afraid you made a mistake? It's never an issue with Brilliant. You can just read the explanation to find out more and learn at your own pace. So, if you're a lifelong learner who wants to give Brilliant a try, you guys can get a free trial plus 20% off the cost of a year's subscription by following the link in the description below. And now back to today's video. Uh, of course, this being the Chinese Imperial Court, things weren't quite as simple as little Zai Chan putting on a crown and Xi Ji suddenly becoming boss of the palace. On his deathbed, Jian Feng signed a proclamation placing power in the hands of eight men under his advisor, Su Shun. The idea was that these men would act as regents until the boy came of age, but since Su Shun was clearly plotting to take control for himself, Xi Ji asked the emperor directly who would succeed him. When Jian Feng replied with, uh, my son, Obvs. Well, the stage was set for an epic power struggle. So, here's the situation as we go into battle. On one side, we have the powerful advisor, Su Shun, and his cabal of prominent men, all favored both politically and by their gender. On the other hand, we have the recently elevated Dowager Empress Xi Qi and Xi'an, with a bit of secret help from Xi'an Feng's brother, Prince Gong. The goal? To become official decision maker for the five year old Xi Chun, the new Tongzi Emperor. The prize? Well, make yourself the most powerful person in all of China. And in a real-life squid game like this, there could only be one winner. At the moment, the starting gun was fired on this epic showdown. Smart money was on a Sushun victory. After all, he was important, connected, a respected, powerful male going up against a former concubine. You can almost imagine him cackling like dick dastardly as he declares, Don't worry, little lady, this'll hurt you more than it hurts me. But in this, our villain would be proven spectacularly wrong. For all society may have regarded her as a mere concubine, there was nothing mere about Siji. She was shrewd, intelligent, and don't forget, versed in chess from a young age. And in the giant three-dimensional chess game that Sushin didn't even know he was playing, she could see a bazillion moves ahead. The first smart thing Si Chi and Xi'an did was getting everyone to agree to let them write the royal seal. In this era, all Chinese laws had to be literally signed off by the emperor. But since Xi Chun was so young, having the whole nation wait on a five-year-old's handwriting skills was a clear route to disaster. So Si Chi was all like, yeah, you know what? How about me and Xi'an do it? And just save everybody the trouble, yeah? To which Sushin assented probably while smirking about how it fobbed her off with trinkets. But the power to make laws actually legal obviously wasn't a trinket at all. Still, Si Chi couldn't just write a letter saying feed Sushun to the lions and sign it into law. No, no, no. She needed a reason to take down her nemesis. Which leads us up to her second smart move, making a child cry. One day, when Sushun and the regents were doing their thing, Xi Qi came up to them with Zai Chen in tow. She was then just so objectionable that the regents lost their tempers and started shouting at her, which caused Zai Chen to burst into tears. But rather than going, oh, whoops, sorry, my bad, Xi Qi instead declared that the regents had disrespected the young emperor, an act tantamount to treason. It was around this time that Sushun began plotting to kill her, but his plans were too little. Too late. In November 1861, a 10-day funeral procession was held for the dead Xi'an Feng. Xi Shi informed Su Shun that she'd only be available for part of the ceremony, but that he should attend the whole thing since it'd be a show of great respect. Perhaps spooked by the whole bawling emperor episode, Su Shun agreed. Then, while he was out at the funeral, Xi Shi set up the perfect checkmate. During the ten days, Xi Qi, Xi'an, and Prince Gong worked feverishly to whip up palace sentiment against the regions. Finally, at the end of the procession, they unveiled a proclamation in Xi Chun's name, signed by Xi Qi's seal, and it charged them all with treason. 
Sushum was arrested and sentenced to death by a thousand cuts, a sentence Sichi commuted to death by decapitation. Two other regions were ordered to commit suicide, and the rest were stripped of their wealth and sent into exile. In the wake of the near bloodless coup, a second proclamation went out. This one declaring that Xi'an and Sichi, with advice from Prince Gong, would now decide on all matters of state. And with that, it was game, set, a match. Aged just 26, Sichi had done it. Along with Xi'an, she had outmaneuvered everyone to become the most important person in China. And what's a sharp, ambitious girl to do with near unlimited power? Why, transform her country, of course. From the moment Sushun was executed, Xi Qi became effectively the ruler of China, a position that should hold all the way through to 1908. Yet thanks to her gender, that position would never be official. She would be treated as equal to the emperors she ruled on behalf of, forced to sit behind a silk screen during meetings, and forbidden from setting foot in front of the imperial palace. Despite these limitations, though, she'd wind up overseeing one of the most transformative programs in Chinese history. With Prince Gong focused on practical matters and Xi'an happy to stay in the shadows, it would be Xi Qi who'd make the major policy decisions. Perhaps one of the most major was to pivot China towards the West. Although the Opium Wars were over now, the Taiping were still causing chaos. So Xi Qi put aside the humiliation of the unequal treaties signed with Britain, France, and others, and instead asked them for help modernizing her army. The British agreed, and did such a good job that the Qing were finally able to end the Taiping Rebellion in 1864, by which time some 20 million people had died. But this massive military upgrade would turn out to be only the beginning of China's westward tilt. Under the self-strengthening movement, trade was further opened up to Europe. Western schools were established to teach European languages, Western officials hired to clamp down on corruption and graft. Advisors were invited from the leading economies to do everything from spearhead agricultural reforms to teach the Qing military how to build modern weapons. The result was a slow but steady opening up, a transformation that saw China gain its first modern navy, postal service, and monetary system. The first vestiges of industrialization crept in too, as mines were opened and telegraph systems were laid. Not that Xi Qi's embrace of Western-style modernity was absolute. No matter how hard outside investors tried, they couldn't get China to invest in railroads. Xi Qi was just too adamant that the noise would disturb ancestral tombs dotted across the countryside. It would take until 1876 for her to get permission for a single working line to be laid, by which time the political conditions would have drastically changed. First, there was the accidental near war with France that came close to crisis. With China becoming stronger, plenty of Xi Qi's advisors, such as Prince Gong's brother, Prince Chun, were demanding that she use that new strength to get revenge for the unequal treaties. When Xi Qi demurred, Chun helped orchestrate anti-Christian riots, riots that saw French citizens lynched. Luckily, the disaster of the Franco-Prussian War meant that France was less willing to fight than usual, and Xi Qi managed to mollify Paris. But the second shake-up would be even bigger. On January 2, 1875, Zeitron died of smallpox, not yet 20. Although he had taken over as emperor when he was 16, Zeitron still hadn't managed to sire an heir. While his empress was pregnant when he died, her family ordered her to starve herself to death in a show of piety, although rumors persist that Siji arranged the whole thing. With no son to elevate, the dying emperor handed the power to choose his successor to Siji. The successor she chose, Prince Chun's three-year-old son. Now, there are a couple of different ways to read this. The first cynical one is that Sichi and Xi'an weren't interested in stepping aside and needed a new, very young emperor that they could rule in place of. Since his son becoming emperor would also force the annoying Prince Chun to give up his duties, that was two birds with one stone. The slightly kinder reading is that the Dowager Empress was hamstrung by convention, unable to pick anyone older than the dead emperor had been, and lacking any decent teenage candidates. Either way, Chun's infant was elevated to Guangzhou Emperor, and Xi'an and Sichi officially made his parents. While the boy was told to address Xi'an as his mother, he was made to refer to Sichi as blessed father. Simple expediency, or Sichi signaling loud and clear that she was as good as any male, well, we'll let you be the judge. As the 1870s closed then, Sichi was firmly ensconced at the head of a powerful triumvirate, leading a rapidly modernizing nation into the last years of the 19th century. Yet, comfortable as she was, Sichi couldn't shield herself from all misfortunes. And the dawning of the new decade was going to bring with it something the Dowager Empress had never experienced before. Real, unimaginable tragedy.
Generally speaking, popular sentiment has seen Sichi in one of two ways. The first is the more modern view, as a strong, capable woman who created a brief oasis of stability in a century of chaos. The other is as the Chinese equivalent of Agrippina, a murderous she-devil who murdered everybody who got in her way. Which opinion you subscribe to will probably dictate how you feel about what happens next. On April the 8th, 1881, Sichi's co-regent, Xi'an, suddenly died aged just 43. For those of the Sichi murdered everyone school of Chinese history, this is evidence that her lust for power was growing, causing her to bump off her only rival. But for those who prefer a shade more nuance, a kinder reading is that this was the first time Sichi was forced to face real tragedy. From the moment she had intervened with Xi'an Feng to save the older woman's life, Xi'an had been Sichi's one constant ally. Her friend, a confidant, a protector. To suddenly be without her must have been like waking up one day to find your legs have vanished, a shock you can't ever imagine recovering from. Certainly, Xi'an's exit seems to have destabilized the Dowager Empress. The years that followed saw the reforming zeal of the 1870s give way to a kind of directionlessness, as Sichi refused further industrialization, got in a short and conclusive war with France over Vietnam, and even ended up firing her loyal lieutenant, Prince Gong. Finally, in 1889, it seems as if Sichi had had enough. As the Guangzhou Emperor reached maturity, the 54-year-old Sichi announced that she was stepping down. There'd be no new child emperor, no attempt to cling to power, just a peaceful retirement to an expensive recreation of the Summer Palace to wait out the end of her days. At least that was the plan. As can be seen throughout human history, though, once someone has been in power too long, it can be hard for them to let go, especially if their successor isn't up to scratch. And Guangzhou was all too aware of his weaknesses. Even once made emperor, Prince Chun's son would meet Sichi several times a week to seek her advice, a habit that soon led his own advisors to basically say, screw it, why don't we just skip this and just go and talk directly to Sichi? Hmm? Now, this arrangement wasn't necessarily fatal, not if Guangzhou and Sichi were pulling in the same direction. But what if there was some, say, gigantic catastrophe that pushed them? in opposite directions. Well, in 1894, that catastrophe blew up in the shape of the First Sino-Japanese War. We'll likely cover this over on our new channel, War of Graphics, one day. Uh, go over and subscribe to that, so we'll keep things rather simple here. And the simplest version is that China got its ass absolutely whipped. In the aftermath of this latest humiliation, Guangxi became convinced that Xi Qi's reforms hadn't gone far enough, that China needed to modernize now to stand any chance of catching up with its belligerent neighbor. So, against Xi Qi's wishes, the emperor launched the Hundred Days Reform in 1898, determined to upend society. Instead, he brought about his own downfall. Always against these reforms, Xi Qi was told by our advisors that Guangxi had become a puppet of Japan. So, with a coldness matched only by her competence, she launched a coup. The emperor was arrested, imprisoned on an island. His fellow reformers were executed, or else they fled to Tokyo. By the time the dust settled, the reform era was definitively over. Once again, China's matriarch was in charge. This time, though, it would be the aging dowager empress herself who'd wind up unleashing chaos on her people. One reason people have so differing opinions on Sichi is that there are few instances where things are totally clear-cut. Like, maybe she killed her rivals, or maybe she didn't. Maybe she was foolish to end the Guangzhou Emperor's reforms, but maybe her own reformist history gives her a pass. However, there's no ambiguity where the box of rebellion is concerned. No matter how you cut it, Sichi's response to the uprising was a disaster. Launched in 1899 by the epically named Righteous and Harmonious Fists, the Boxer Rebellion was an anti-Western, anti-Christian insurrection that ultimately killed 100,000 people. In the early stages, these deaths were Westerners and Chinese accused of picking up Western habits. But then the eight-nation alliance of Austria-Hungary, the USA, Great Britain, France, Italy, Germany, Japan, and Russia, they launched a joint invasion of China to protect their citizens and... Everything went absolutely nuts. Rather than suppress the boxers, Sichi came out on their side, declaring a war for survival against the Eight-Nation Alliance. This led to the Alliance attacking Beijing, where the boxers were laying siege to foreign embassies, causing Sichi and a court to flee. 
It was like the burning of the Summer Palace all over again. But while the British had very much been at fault in 1860, in 1900, Sichi had to shoulder at least some of the blame. The Boxer Rebellion ended in 1901 with an alliance victory and mass execution of suspected rebels. The treaty then forced on China was so humiliating, it made even the ending to the Second Opium War look like mere fetish play in comparison. Crippled by a gigantic indemnity, Beijing was pushed toward bankruptcy. Foreign troops were stationed in the nation on a permanent basis. But one aspect of pre-rebellion life that would survive was Sichi herself. In 1901, Sichi issued the Decree of Self-Reproach, blaming herself for the war. She then tried to make amends by ushering in something called the Late Qing Reforms, an overhaul of the state that went beyond even what the emperor had attempted. Tax, policing, the judiciary, education were all completely upended. Footbinding was banned, and ethnic marriages between the Han and Manchus legalized, a degree of press freedom instituted. By 1906, Sichi was even decreeing that China would become a constitutional monarchy, complete with elections and a degree of male suffrage, potentially the greatest reform the nation had yet seen. But in the end, it wouldn't be Sichi's late-life edicts that had the greatest impact on history, but what she did on her final day. In 1908, Sichi fell badly ill. Sensing that the end was near, it seems she acted to preserve her legacy. On November the 14th, the Guangzhou Emperor died in his luxurious prison. A hundred days later, scientific analysis of his body would confirm that he was poisoned with arsenic. Did Sichi bump him off? Well, we can't say for sure. Maybe it was a wider conspiracy in which her own illness was also the result of poisoning. But if any of the deaths in this video could be laid at her feet, it's probably this one. Shortly after the airless emperor's death, Sichi chose the man who would succeed him, or rather, the boy, Prince Chun's two-year-old son, Pu Yi, famous today as the last emperor. Mere hours later, Sichi herself died. On November the 15th, 1908, she was 72. At the moment she passed, Sichi was the grand matriarch of an empire that had lasted in various forms for thousands of years. An empire that was in need of reform, certainly, but making steps in the right direction. Within three years, though, all of that would have been swept away. In 1911, Pu Yi would be deposed in a revolution, leading China to collapse into the anarchy of the warlord era, a process that would eventually lead to the rise of two competing visions for the future, that of Chiang Kai-shek and that of Mao Zedong. But by then, Sichi would have been lost to history, her tomb destroyed in 1927, her body desecrated and then thrown away like so much trash. In the decades since, the Dowager Empress's reputation has been on a wild ride. From a figure of revulsion, she came to be seen as a complex failure, and more recently, as a strong, admirable woman who did her best to lead her country through a dark time. Today, we're finally in a position to appreciate the nuances of her rule, to see clearly both the good and the bad. Without a doubt, she was a remarkable figure, a woman who rose to power in a man's world and then proceeded to reform imperial China in ways no man had ever dreamed. Yet, we also have to accept that those reforms ultimately failed. That she stopped the last necessary steps under the Guangzhou Emperor, then left behind a system that wouldn't survive another half decade. Was she brilliant? Venal? Inspirational? Destructive? The truth is that she was maybe all these things and many more. A woman who shaped the destiny of a billion people, in some eras brilliantly, in others, such as the Boxer Rebellion, catastrophically. What she never was, though, was inconsequential, for both good and ill. Sichi shaped China for nearly half a century, and that alone ensures that she'll never be forgotten. So I really hope you found today's video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, as I mentioned, Warographics, new channel, link below. Thanks for watching.